Production funding is provided by A. Reddix and Associates Health Information Resource Center, offering short-term training for long-term professional careers in medical coding. HIRCVA.net. Discussing the issues and celebrating the successes of the African-American community. This is Another View. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. It's all about politics with our roundtable this evening, and we're covering the spectrum from voter redistricting in Norfolk to how decisions at the state capitol are affecting Another View. Should be an interesting conversation, so let's get started. Please welcome Roger Chesley, columnist for the Virginian Pilot, and you can catch his columns Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. Carol Pretlow, Associate Professor of Political Science at Norfolk State University. Community activist Bill Thomas, and Will Levice, journalist, talk show host, and author of Fired Up, How to Win When You Lose Your Job. Welcome, everybody. Hello. Hey, how are you? All right. Hey, good. Okay, we got, we got a lot to talk about, and we'll get to the sad news later on. But Norfolk doing some redistricting based on the census. Um, Rodney Jordan pops up at the last mm -hmm. minute with a, an alternative plan. And I just want to read this real short thing. He says the proposal creates an influence district mm -hmm. that closely mirrors the 2010 census demographics of the city. It creates a majority non-white ward in population, but a majority white district in voting age population. It creates a competitive district, which I call an influence ward, not driven by race, but by the interests of the citizens who reside there. But the council said, too late. Yeah, and the council has pretty much said earlier this week that they are going to go with one of the compromise plans that the council members had already come up with. Mm -hmm. So uh, Rodney's plan, though interesting, it doesn't look like it has any chance of getting passage, at least this year. Well, but, he, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. But, but the other thing, I, I think it was good that he brought the subject around because since the council went about five, six years ago to an eight-member uh, council, mm -hmm. It's always been 5-3 split on council, whereas before that it had been a 4-3 split many of the times. So it's made the disparity look uh, a little bit even greater. Because yeah, actually his plan would have made it a 4-4 four, four split. Possibly. 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 Yeah. But Carol, the, there's been redistricting going on all over the place. I mean, not just Norfolk, but statewide, um, across the country with the 2010 census. But are people paying attention? I don't think the majority of people do pay attention, and I think that's why the compromise plan is such an important facet. Even though it doesn't get accepted, mm -hmm. at least it gets the issues out there, and people will pay attention to that. Um, before this, when you're just saying there's a census and this is how it's going to end up, people think numbers, I don't know anything about that, and they don't focus in on the implications. Mm -hmm. of but do we do a good enough job, Will, of even advertising? I don't frankly remember hearing a lot about the fact that there were open meetings for people to come and even talk about redistricting in Norfolk. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, I live in Suffolk, so the Norfolk situation <laughs> wasn't that, 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 was right. that much on my radar screen, mm -hmm. but I know that that was one of the issues of whether people even knew that they had an opportunity to even speak out on this, and I think that it's a function of what's happening in our society. I mean, I know those things were promoted in the paper. I know mm -hmm. it was promoted in the media, mm -hmm. but uh, people are very much distracted and they're not paying attention. So it's commendable that Rodney came forth and exactly. issued a proposal because part of the process was the, the public had a right to issue proposals, mm -hmm. and he took advantage of that. Bill? <laughs> <laughs> That's all I got to say is Bill. Bill. <laughs> no, really, really it's, a, it's a really easy concept for me. It's called learned helplessness. I mean, it doesn't do any good if you come up with something a day late and a dollar short. I mean, you know, every 10 years they come up with this, then if you don't win, it's you lose. And, and, and even more important than that, I know, I know Rodney thinks he's a great guy. I think he ought to get the people in the primarily uh, African-American wars to go vote. Didn't the last pr primary election only two or three percent of our folks, African-Americans, go out and vote, period? I think it's all the wrong reasons for all the wrong reasons. People have got to vote and then they have to participate. They have to read. If you want, to, mm -hmm. if you want something that not to be a secret <laughs> in the black community too much, and the white community too much, we're talking about the black community, mm -hmm. put it in the paper, put it in a book. And, and nobody will know and about, nobody it. Know about <laughs> it. And then you wait until the last minute, and then you complain because that's that's bad. Mm -hmm. That's not good. That's bad. So, 
encouraging someone to come up at the last minute with a last minute plan that's not part of the process, I don't think that's commendable. Well, no, I, I, what I do think is commendable, though, is that he came up with something. something. That's and, right. and the fact of the matter is, it was going to be a hard sell with the current council. Anyway, uh, there is so much incumbent protection on the council, and that's part of the reason why it's now an eight-member council instead of a seven-member council. It, no way should it have changed when they did that six years ago. It, they, they could have rejiggered the five smaller wards and made that into four and allowed the mayor to run citywide. But mm -hmm. they didn't want anybody to lose his or her current seat uh, that was on the council. And, and, and so now you see, again, it's a 5-3 split, and it's, it seems as if, if the whites on council don't want to vote for something, they can pretty much do what they want all the time. And, and make it go through. It, it's not always a split like that on yeah. council. Occasionally there is. So. Dwayne Hawkins wrote um, an article, and he said, um, from, from Hampton University, and he said that uh, <laughs> this was an opportunity for politicians to pick their voters. Hmm. In a, as opposed to an opportunity for voters to elect their officials when they do this redistricting, it's a chance. What do you think, Carol? You're the political scientist. Well, you know, I, <laughs> I, if I were a cynic, I would agree with that. But I guess I'm Pollyanna in the respect that I do believe voters pick the candidates and voters make the decision. The problem is, and I agree with you, that in the you black agree community, with uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I must be ill. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> but the, but, no, this is the last show. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that in the black community, we have a history of paying attention to the federal election, particularly the presidential election. Right. And then when everything else falls in place, oh, well, I don't care about who's mayor, who's on the city council, who's on the school board. We don't pay attention, and we should be. I'm going to disagree with you a little bit there, because I think that's the case, regardless of race, wh who is the uh, candidate. I think that ordinarily you see the lower turnout for the uh, the smaller elections, the local elections, the school board elections. It's but aren't those the elections that, that really the directly matter. impact oh, the yes, local exactly. elections? Of course Not it is, the federal election. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, but, but that's just the nature of it, and I think that that goes, that's beyond race. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know. I, I, I just think that's not true. I mean, we as a people don't vote. And it's, it's historically, and there's dynamics to the division in that. We do not vote locally. And uh, so it really doesn't matter. It's a waste of time, actually, because we don't vote. If we're voting in 5 and 10 percent ranges, when other communities are voting in 30, 40, 50 percent ranges, it doesn't matter. It's over. It's a fake complete. We're not going to be successful, and that's why we're not. Why do you think uh, that is, and what could we do about it? People are too lazy. They don't want to get out and vote. They don't want to get out and participate. They don't want to go to the redistricting hearings. I mean, it's just laziness. Oh, I don't think it's It's lazy. Laziness. People are lazy. They don't want to get involved. They're too ahead, selfish, Carol. and they're lazy. I don't think it's laziness. I think it may be that they are uninformed and don't understand the importance uh, of it. And work. if in our communities, our churches, our civic organizations, our educational institutions, we emphasize the importance of it and make sure that every school child knows that democracy comes from the bottom up, I think that is the panacea from and I question your statistics on what the other communities do in terms of vote I think turnout. Nobody and, and votes. And I mean, the local elections that, generally have had the worst I've turnout. I've been questioned before, yeah. and I'll provide you with the statistics, but it, it just doesn't happen. Could you do it now? No, I, can't, no, no I, I can't do it now, <laughs> but I'll <laughs> just like I told yeah, you I that. I think as a culture, we don't appreciate voting as, as nearly you. as much as, as we should. But when I say as a culture, I'm not just talking about black folk. I'm talking about as an American culture. Mm. We don't appreciate voting. And, and nearly and, as much as we should. And less so it's until something board. goes wrong. And the that's thing right. that's it's most terrible about that, all the all the things that blacks had to do just to get the right Ex to vote, mm -hmm. you know, it's 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 crazy that that's the case. Yeah, that you is know. frustrating because we had to go through but so it much is the case. to get the yeah. right to vote. It, it yeah. is the case. The other issue too, I mean, as you talk about race, is to ask, uh, you know, why is it that Norfolk hasn't had a black mayor? Because people don't vote. Why is it that, you know, Virginia Beach is having difficulty even having no, black black council council black council black council people. Because they don't these, are, these are two of the most well-known cities yeah. in this area. Yeah. They're supposed to be progressive cities, and Portsmouth has done it. Suffolk has done it. Hampton, Chesapeake, Chesapeake has done Hampton, it. Hampton, Newport News has had twice. Absolutely. Two, in, including the current mayor. I mean, that's a big issue. Rich What's so, going on there? Go ahead, Carol. What, and I piggyback on your question, what do we do about it, though? Years ago when I moved to Norfolk and Mason Andrews was a mayor, 
He and I was kind of a rebellious kind of person. Really? Respectfully oh, wow, rebellious. that's a surprise. <laughs> and, and, and I'll never forget him telling me that Norfolk has never had a riot in the history of, of, of the city. Mm -hmm. Black folks have never got upset about anything. I, I don't know. I, it, that that bothers. So is me. a riot the the the, the bell ringer to, to whether or not when somebody engaged? knocks you down and kick you and you don't fight back. They call it a riot. I call it fighting back. I'm not talking about going burning down my house or because I'm mad at the white man or something like that. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about if somebody kicked me, I'm going to kick them back. If somebody hit me upside the head with a billy club as they tried to do in Kansas City, we went back and fought for our rights because that's what you had to do. Okay. And people don't do that here. I mean, they just don't do it. They don't fight back. Good they don't morning. fight back physically, and they don't fight back at the voting box. At the voting box. So well, we do have a, a presidential election coming, mm -hmm. and the Republicans are all just, I mean, how many candidates are there now? I, 12, 14, count. 15, <laughs> I can't I keep lost up. Count too. But there is an African-American who's running, Herman Cain. And before we talk about him, we do have a soundbite um, about his feelings on how the bills should be handled if he were to become president. Mm -hmm. Don't try to pass a 2,700 page bill and even they didn't read it. <laughs> you and I didn't have time to read it. We're too busy trying to live, send our kids to school. Well, that's why I'm going to only allow small bills, three pages. <laughs> Three pages. <laughs> <laughs> Every bill has to be three pages. Oh, I mean, yeah. seriously, that, what are your thoughts about this bill? <laughs> Herman Cade has a right to run for president just like anybody else. Seems to be very sharp, articulate, and clean. No, and why? No, but, um, yeah, but yeah, I think well that, um, you know, I, I think that Anything can happen. I mean, at this point of the election, when uh, Obama, President Obama, was running, and became, I mean, at this point, no one was taking him seriously and thought that he can do it. And I think that Herman Cain is saying one or two things. He's saying, look, if Obama was able to do it, I may be able to do it. And then the other thing he's saying is that, hey, if I get out here and make a name for myself, national platform, I can't lose because I'm going to be able to follow the model of Sarah Palin, which is make a whole lot of money out there on the speaking circuit and mm -hmm. books and be able to show up at events. So, you know, I, I think that he's put himself in a position where he can't lose. And if nothing else, he's running for a vice president. Well, Bill, since you are the resident conservative on this uh -huh. panel, your thoughts on Mr. Kane? Oh, he's, uh, I respect him because he's done well with his life. He's mm -hmm. served it well. Uh, he lived in Memphis and he grew up and he was put on a, a on a mission to do something good and be a leader in his community. He's accomplished that. He's, he's, he ran a major business. And uh, he's talking practical stuff, real things, things that happen. They should put the bills on the Internet. They should be something that normal people can read and understand. What's wrong with that? Well, well most bills are on the Internet. If you have the bill number, though, you can, you can see it. Yeah. I actually, I like a lot more of what Bill has said, and I'd rather him run for president than Herman Cain, though. When you, when you say something like the bills can only be three pages, you, you don't want to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. And when you say that, it, and he doesn't have, he, he's, the, you know, it's the congressmen who are going to be ultimately introducing legislation anyway. So, you, you know. Well, what about his comments about um, if, would he allow uh, someone of the Muslim faith in his cabinet? And he was saying, he was quoted as saying that, well, there's discrepancy over what he said, but he, he claims that he would ask them questions about their religion and so forth, but would not ask those same questions of someone who was a Christian or Jewish or, or of another religion. Yeah, I think there would be a problem with that because you are not supposed to be discriminatory and that does, has a little faint characteristic of discrimination against re religion. And I think you could afford to ask uh, anyone about their commitment to the United States and their citizenship. But I, by phrasing it specifically uh, you know, you know, toward a religious uh, uh, faith, I think there's problems. It's mm -hmm. political talk. It's, it speaks to his base. Mm -hmm. It's political talk. And his I mean, he knows that. His he base is the Tea Party, right? Yeah. Right. And so, yeah. Yeah. so that was clear. I mean, I think it was wrong. He shouldn't have done it. And if he does do that, he feel uncomfortable with a Muslim or something, then that's his 
problem, not mine, but he was speaking to his base. So he was trying to get some votes and some money, and, and that's not good. That's and then, not and then, you know, then hopefully people forget that that was said, and oh, the time goes forget. on, and you move on, then, or, or you do like what Gingrich has done, you know, mm -hmm. if I said it, you know, you can't refer to that anymore. I mean, that's, that's yeah. just Well, actually, if he game. stands behind it and uh, he believes it, it's probably going to help him more than it's going to hurt him. Well, he I mean, how many I think votes there are a lot of Republicans yeah. who think the same way. Yeah, right. so but he's he's probably off. a few he Democrats, probably too. Democrats But he pulled back too. off of his son. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he he clarified it some. Yeah, only when he was ca called on it. Though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so politics around the Father's Day holiday. Hallmark came up with a card for single mothers on Father's Day. And those who don't know about uh, uh, the mahogany line, mm -hmm. that is a black line of cards. And they came up with a single mother card for Father's Day. Well, you wrote a column. You wrote, wrote some, some words about that. Yeah, it was Tell a, us about your feelings. It was feelings. quite an interesting <laughs> column. Yeah, it's got a lot of responses. And Hallmark, to their credit, afterwards did uh, send me a note because I, con I contacted them before I wrote the column to get their to get their insight, you know, what, what is going on here. Mm -hmm. And they explained that they had a demand for it. They've been doing it for a couple of years, which I actually did say in the column, and that it was not a big seller for them, but they were simply meeting what they perceived to be somewhat of a demand for the card. I mean, quite frankly, my column, the card and Hallmark, as Roger knows, mm. these columns are, these, these things are jumping off points <laughs> to talk about a bigger issue. Well, but what issue. does that say about our community? And that's what that, my column was about. Is, you, know, <laughs> you know, if uh, you can put out the word there that, that mothers should be honored on Father's Day, that doesn't say very anything very positive so about our So are you saying that the cards were directed at the African, these mahogany cards? The mahogany cards they actually were directed a mahogany at the card, African American But they also yes. had a card they, they explained for a general community as well. No, but, no, but it's a no, small, no, the, the mahogany thing is really the main impetus no, actually, of this. And as I pointed out in my column, that's the, that's the problem is in the community we have a crisis. Two or three children mm -hmm. living without their dads. If we get into the mindset of I want to make the children feel better or make mom feel better by saying your mom, you're doing the dad's role too. We're not helping the situation. Mm -hmm. Father's Day was inspired by a single dad. Daughter raised by a single dad said, you know, my dad did a great job. I want to celebrate dads. And this was after Mother's Day already existed. So mm -hmm. if we had this crisis, if, if you want to turn this thing around and how we think, you want to celebrate fathers who are doing the right thing. Celebrate mm -hmm. surrogates who are mentoring men, mm -hmm. but don't, in a backdoor kind of way, still put emphasis to the father that's not there by celebrating the mom. It's, you know, yeah, and no. we do celebrate Mother's Day. Uh, Chris yeah. Rock has this uh, skip where he says there are no nice songs about fathers. Papa was a Rolling Stone. Right. You know? <laughs> and he says, well, why not celebrate? You know, his whole point was we don't do enough to celebrate the fathers that are doing mm -hmm. the right thing. So, I mean, it seems like there was a controversy that was ginned up that didn't have to be. Right. I mean, we already have a Mother's Day. We try to treat moms nice on that day. And I like being tr treated nice on Father's, on Father's day. day. Thank right. you. You deserve yeah, you exactly. it. Exactly. Yes, but 364 is, days out of the year. But what, are there, but, but my other question, too, is are there fathers, are there cards for fathers who are taking care of their household on Mother's Day? They told me I mean, to know words, that there, there are the some. Other way? There are some, but culturally, American culturally, we don't celebrate fathers in that way. And again, the holiday originally, Mother's Day already existed. And a single dad, a widowed dad, is who inspired Father's Day. So obviously it didn't make sense to say, Dad, happy Mother's Day. It was, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. we should celebrate but, the father. But the reality is our communities, the African American community in inner city neighborhoods across America mm -hmm. are gone. They're dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they are gone. Uh, we have over 80, 90 percent uh, that bringing kids in the world without a father there. We have 16 to 30 percent unemployment rate, 16 for average people, for teenagers, 29 and 30 percent unemployment. We have no job creation there. Our schools are totally broken. In Detroit, they're breaking down the whole school system. I mean, in, in yeah. Chicago, the whole system is broke. We, we, and, and it has come such a culturally accepted thing. I, that, that's why I thought it was a good article, because it pointed something out to me. 
that even the main media now and the producers of things like this are saying, just for the absent of white, black father in the community, don't get it. Mom, you're the father. Take yeah. it over. Yeah. And, and nobody's saying refuse, anything I, about I it. I refuse to accept yeah. that. But yeah. it's, it's, it's a reality of what it is. Right. Well, I think that all the dads who are doing the right thing do need to be recognized. Last topic. We're don't going away. It. Don't I say know, it. I hate to say it, but it's Governor McDonald. Uh, decided to do line item veto of one item, and that was to cut funding to public broadcasting. And as a result, um, another view is going off the air, off of television. Your thoughts? I mean, I, I think as someone who has experienced, you know, you mentioned my book earlier, experienced losing jobs. You know, this was a political decision. The budget, the amount of money, let's be honest, is probably very insignificant in terms of the overall budget. Of course. Not that yes. greatly significant. And a lot of times people call for, let's defund public broadcasting and different things because it, politically it sounds good. And government but what, schools. Right. Uh, well, but what people forget is that at the end of the road, there are jobs that are lost. So how can you be for jobs and for families and, we did have to and their people people's too. jobs? So all of those who were rallying for this and calling for recognize that they are now families that have been majorly impacted. So think about that, too. Yeah. I agree with that, but Bob McDonald didn't have anything to do with this program going off the air. We did. We have to get Don't out of lead. depending Let's on... Lead. We did. No, we here. If we want this program to go forward, you're the leader, we're the participants, we need to go out and become self-sufficient. We have to stop relying on that word y'all don't like hearing, government. Government is not fair. Government is vindictive. Government don't care about families. They don't care about the people that lost their jobs here. That's why we have to defend ourselves, our ability to so you're sustain saying that, our families. That, that we, as the collective community, should have pulled together enough money to absolutely. Keep it on here. Or let's go out and find some sources. Let's go out and, and engage. I, I thought there were some some political processes then by this station and others to do it. But if they can give forty six million dollars to the Yorktown Museum for whatever reason they want to, out of their transportation bill mm -hmm. that all of us are paying for, Lord knows, I, you know, you got to make a decision. But mm -hmm. I don't I don't fault Bob McDonald when this. Bob McDonald just kicked me in my behind and told me, hey, Thomas, you got to go defend for yourself, which I believe in, mm -hmm. because I don't trust the government, Bob McDonald or Tim Kaine, to be my daddy or to be be responsible for my living. All I want is um, okay. some consistent uh, guidelines and some consistent results, and that's not what happened. What when he gave all these millions to Steven Spielberg, who didn't need the money to come here uh, to make a film, it's just ridiculous. And then to say, well, there are all these choices in the marketplace that can uh, take care of things, I, I want to see who's going to air his next well, state of the say, commonwealth it's speech ironic next year. That public, public media was the only ones that aired his state of the exactly. commonwealth address and not the commercial maybe, station maybe, exactly. he can, maybe he can have a live uh, he can type and get his speech out there to everybody <laughs> next year <laughs> You know, it was just vindictive and he was playing to his base and it was just mean spirited and it might make for a good sound bite if he becomes vice president and it might might make him loved by everybody on that side of the aisle mm -hmm. but you know it wasn't much for the people who live in this community I think it was short-sighted uh, with regard to this community and it also shows that this is a very political game it's not results oriented it's who has the power who can do what they mm -hmm. want to do with the power that they have and how much the community is going to respond to it. And I think this community needs to actually become activists. But, but actually, Last I think, word, actually I think the black community oh, no. should step up to protect this program because we're doing things to help educate. But when we sit back and let them start this Virginia Sesentennial, which is celebrating the 150 year of the people who wanted to make me their <laughs> slaves, and then that's coming out of our tax dollars. That budget's got to be at least two or three million dollars a year. And we don't stand up and fight for that, then that's what happened to us. And on that, ladies and gentlemen, this is the last television roundtable. But I will see you on the radio, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Thanks so much. And we'll be right back after this look at what's happening in Hampton Roads.
So now you know, this is the next to the last television broadcast of Another View. It's been a tough few weeks here at WHRO. Sadly, five of our colleagues lost their jobs as a result of state budget cuts. And after July 1, What Matters, hosted by Kathy Lewis, and Another View will no longer be produced. My mom always taught me to look for the good in any situation, and there is some great news. Another View is moving to radio. We will continue to discuss the issues and celebrate the successes of the African American community for an hour every Friday on 89.5 WHRV-FM. We hope you'll come on over to the radio beginning July 15th and spend some time with us. Next week, our final television program, and it's a touchy subject within the African American community, light versus dark skin, or intra-racial discrimination. You won't want to miss it, and we'll see you next time for another view. Production funding is provided by A. Reddix and Associates, Health Information Resource Center, offering short-term training for long-term professional careers in medical coding. HIRCVA.net.